Kia ora tātou. Hoi anō e ngā rangatira tēnei te mehi atu ki a koutou i tatu mai nei tēnei wā te whakanui ake tēnei kaupapa meki, nau mai, nau mai, whakatau mai. E te tuatai i kei te mehi atu au ki te kāngo rungarau a te tīmata me te hakumutungo o ngā mea katoa. Nā nei i hōma e māne e tango atu, nō reira e pā, tēnā koe i taipai tātou i tēnei wā te whakanui ake tēnei a tātou kaupapa i mui a mātou i tēnei rā, nō reira tēnā koe, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. He whakaaro hoki kia rātou ko a whetūrangi tia, a mē ki, haere, a haere, a haere atura. Tērā o ngā rangatira, e hinga ai, i tērā taho, a mē ki, a tērā rangatira, nō ngā tiparau. Haere atura, haere atura e api. Tainoa ki ngā mate o tēnā o tēnā marae, hurino, hurino o te motu, a tēnā tātou katoa. Nau mai, nau mai, whakatau mai, welcome. Nau mai whakatau mai i rungi ngā ahua tanga o te wā. I tēnei wā he whakaaro hoki ki a rātou a me ki te mana whenua o tēnei a tātou. Tēnei te mehi atu i homa i tēnei honore hei mehi atu ki a koutou. Me ki ngā kaitiaki hoki o tēnei a tātou whare. Me ki tēnei ruma a nau mai a tēnei te mehi hoki ki a koutou katoa. Kā reo e kume a ke tēnei kōreo. He mehi poto tēnei whakamahana i te kōreo i muri i au. E mihi atu ki a koutou i tēnei wā. Nō reira, nau mai, nau mai, a whakatau mai. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou katoa. E hara i te me. Te hono tātou, hono te hunga wairua ki te hunga wairua. Haere atura, haere atura, moi mai rā. Apiti hono tātou, hono te hunga ore i hui hui mai nei i raru i te maru o tēnei au kaupapa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Katoa. Kia ora, Donovan, thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's lovely to see so many of you here today and it's my pleasure um, to welcome you here today um, for the conversation we're going to have and to listen to Jeremy talking about some findings from super, some super research about how people on lower incomes judge their income to be adequate or not. Um, and our aim in doing this was um, to bring the voices of family and whanau um, in and listen to them um, to complement some quantitative analysis that the Treasury had been doing where they were looking at the Household Economic Expenditure Survey, found that some people on the same level of income reported they had enough income and others said they didn't. And the question one was, why is that? Um, so this is a qualitative piece of work that starts to say, why is that? Um, and I uh, just want to say, at SUPRU, our role is um, about um, bringing evidence in decision-making processes. Um, so we don't make policy, we don't make funding decisions, we don't deliver services, but we do bring evidence in, um, into conversations like this, into policy processes, so that um, people can understand um, the issues and think about solutions and have conversations. So that's our purpose today. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy today's presentation and that you find it stimulating and there's plenty of time for questions at the end. So. Hopefully we'll get a conversation going as well. So I'd like to introduce Jeremy Robertson, who um, will be taking us through the findings today. And Jeremy started with Supru um, and its predecessor to the Families Commission three or four years ago. Um, he has a PhD and his PhD is around step families. So he's also published some research on that that's really interesting, but that's for another day. Um, and has 25 years experience in applied social science research around crime and justice, around families um, up at Victoria University. So um, has a wealth of knowledge to bring to this um, subject. So I hope you enjoy listening to him and then talking to him afterwards. So welcome, Jeremy. So um, thank you for coming today. Um, I, looking around the room, I, I uh, have to acknowledge that there's a lot of expertise in this room in this particular area. Um, and you know, it would be good after the presentation to have some discussion and just reflection on that 
um, you know, when you've got your, your old university teacher sitting in the room here <laughs> with you, it's slightly intimidating, but um, that's, that's fine, Bob. <laughs> um, and Charles as well, and um, many others who've done work in this area. So, um, you know, this is, this is our contribution um, that has to be part of the puzzle that's being built up by the, the work that others have done. I want to um, firstly acknowledge um, the research team, the, uh, Quigley and Watts, Rob Quigley and his team that did this work um, and put together the report. And of course I want to acknowledge the participants, so those families that um, volunteered to, to talk to us about the realities of, of managing on a low income. Um, and you know we try and bring those voices out through the presentation today and also um, in the full report which I encourage you to, to look at and to read. It's available on our website and um, can be downloaded there and I think we're also going to send out a link to that um, after the seminar. So that's the presentation today. Um, what I want to do is just give a little bit of context, a little bit of background to this. Um, Claire's sort of indicated partly where this work has come from, talk about the aim and the approach that we took. Um, some of the findings, I can't cover all of the findings today, so um, you know this will just really be a snapshot in some sense, um, but also consider some of the implications and of course you know I'm a researcher so it's always what comes next, what's the next piece of research we need to be doing. Um, in terms of the context for this, um, Many of you will know that there's been um, an interest in how we measure living standards. We've had income measures, you know, equivalised income, for example. We've had the development of um, non-income measures, so a lot of the work of MSD around living standards and the development of the Living Standards Index. Um, and, and in the, those measures, there are measures around ownership restrictions, around um, participation in, in restrictions and participation in society generally, um, and also around economising. But there's also um, a series of questions that are more of the subjective nature. So asking people to make a judgement about you know, how satisfied they are with their living standards, for example, um, but also um, their perceptions of the adequacy of their income. So one of those questions um, that has come out of that survey or come out of that index is this question. So it asks, it asks people, um, how well does your total income, that's you and your partner, so it's a household income, meet your everyday needs for things such as accommodation, food, clothing, and other necessities? And there's a series of response options there. Um, would you say you have not enough, only just enough, enough, or more than enough? Now that question is, is used um, in a number of surveys and I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. But one of the surveys, a Statistics New Zealand survey, is a household economic survey and that question is included in there. What that, oh, there's a few things I want to point out from that graph. So that graph is showing uh, responses, the responses to that question by income decile. So with the lowest income decile at the top going down to the highest income decile at the bottom. And you can see a couple of things from there. Clearly, income is important. So as you uh, go into the lower income deciles, the number of people that are reporting that they don't have enough increases. There's, there's also that group who say they only have only just enough. So that, the wording of that question actually has changed in recent years. And the, the, it used to be just enough, it's now only just enough. So it's trying to get a more fine-grained analysis of what might be that point between having enough and not enough. And that, that comes out in the research which I'll talk about later. And there's also um, the point that Claire has made that even within those income bands you have some people who are saying I don't have enough or I only just have enough or I have enough. So even in some of those higher um, bands you've got a tiny proportion of people there who are saying they don't have enough, it would be interesting to know why that is. Um, but for this piece of work um, and in discussions with the Treasury, we want to understand a little bit more about the non-income factors that might have contributed to that judgement that people were making. So we commissioned um, a piece of exploratory qualitative research, as Claire's indicated, 
Panderola Subaru is to provide the evidence and knowledge around um, issues and you know this is one that we'd identified where a piece of qualitative work might help us to understand and give some indication of why this is why these patterns are emerging. So the aim of that research is um, really three primary purposes here. Why do some uh, low-income families perceive their income to be adequate while others on a similar income level perceive it to be inadequate? What are the, the range of factors that might impact on that judgment? So things to do with the household, financial and family, wider community factors and what might be a conceptual framework for trying to understand that. And, and I'm going to really focus on the first two points today. The report contains a, um, a, an attempt to bring the data together and propose a, a conceptual framework. Right, the participants, being a researcher, I always, you know, this is really important for me, <laughs> me to look at. <laughs> Straight up, this is, as I said, it's a qualitative study. The idea was to get two groups, those that uh, were reporting that their income was inadequate and those that were reporting that their income was adequate. And it was a series of both focus groups and interviews in three areas. So you can see those areas there, Northland, um, Auckland and Porirua. Um, we we selected participants, or the team selected participants through schools. We wanted um, to put some boundaries on the sample so that we didn't have too much variety, which would make um, um, picking some of this uh, data difficult. So we said uh, the parents should have at least one child aged five, between five and 13 years of age. Uh, the income decile should be between uh, two and four. Um, and as I said, the, there, was, there was a good range of both Pacific, Māori, New Zealand, European um, parents included. So these focus groups and these interviews were recorded and transcribed and then uh, thematic analysis was conducted. So let's just launch into some of the results. So there were, there were both common um, themes that were common to both groups. And there were, there were themes that were different. So we might just start with the common themes. So a lot of the discussion was around um, common values and expectations. And, and one of the common themes that emerged from this was the desire to do the best for the children. That, that really, um, you know, as those, both of those uh, comments illustrate, what they wanted was what was best for for the kids in the circumstances that they were in. So if they were on low income, how best to manage to do the best for their children. But often there was a tension here between maybe taking a job and increasing the household income, but on the other hand, they're not caring, for being able to care for the children as they would have liked. So um, for example, that, that second one I think illustrates that point um, based on her previous experience, her values were that she would like to care for her children, that might have meant that obviously losing an income into the household and that would then have had impact on the you know, degree to which she judged their house to be, um, their income to be adequate or not. Um, and the, you know, the other themes were the importance of family and putting family between income, uh, before income. Um, that's not saying income is not important because clearly it is. But um, also, you know, there were discussions because, you know, these were focus groups and so th although there was some guidance given, there was also quite a bit of a discussion about the role of um, family and the role of values in particular. So maybe religious beliefs, um, expectations. But, th but these families didn't have high expectations. There's no sense in that they, you know, were expecting they wanted a flash car or, you know, um, or, a, or a flash house. They were very sort of humble in terms of their expectations. Another theme that came through uh, quite strongly was the stress um, that many of them were under in, in managing their, on their low incomes. So the time and the energy that it takes to manage. 
So you can see here from, from a couple of quotes in terms of worry, the worry day to day, you know, do I have enough to feed my children? Um, and of course, you know, there's other research recently, you know, the 100 families in Auckland, I think, brings this out as well. Um, you know, it takes time to manage. If you're going to buy, get bargains and buy things that are cheap, you have to put in the search time, <laughs> you know, so that takes time and it also takes energy. So they, that was again as a common thing that, that was coming through. And economising and doing without, um, and, and many of us will know that this is a feature for managing on, on low incomes. Um, you know, what, another parent said, uh, you know, I can't remember the last time I brought anything new off the shelf. You know, so other ways in which um, families talked about economising was how they, uh, in their purchase of food and their use of food, buying low price products, you know, uh, having meat only every, you know, once or twice a week, um, cooking or baking basic foods from scratch, um, hunting and gathering food um, was another feature for some of those families, being really thrifty around food. Buying second hand clothes as well, um, and clothes didn't feature, is it, I think because there's, there's been, or certainly from my perspective, a growth in the availability of second-hand clothes and, and shops and things. Um, that, that was less of an, you know, there, was, there were options, cheap options available there, and then hand-me-downs from family members, etc. was important. Um, and using power wisely. I mean, we've, you know, for recent years, had, had a lot of discussion around power um, and the cost of power. Another thing that really emerged um, in, in the discussions that the parents were having around economising was the impact of this on children. Now, parents were prioritising their children's needs above their own, so they, you know, they would make sure that their children were fed before they were fed. Um, but there were concerns about children missing out on opportunities. So you can see in that second quote around a birthday party. Um, children missing out on birthday parties and missing out on some educational opportunities, um, but also missing out on opportunities to develop talents that they had. So one parent spoke about her daughter, I think it was, that had um, you know, a lot of potential in athletics, but he couldn't afford to get her to competitions, um, and he was really concerned about that. Um, and, and what's interesting, I think, also about that second quote is the fact that the way in which children are aware of what's happening. You know, I've, as Claire's indicated, I've done a lot of research and talked to a lot of families and I've talked to a lot of children as well. And sometimes we underestimate the extent that children are aware of what's happening within their families. <coughs> and, um, you know, here's a, here's a case in point. Someone else talked about, you know, the child blurting out at the check, um, checkout in the supermarket, oh, mum, you know, your FPOS card's been accepted kind of thing, you know, so, you know. <laughs> That child is very aware of what's going on, and, and, and children tailor their expectations accordingly. And, and you know, there's an emerging research actually in that area, which is quite interesting. Now, now some of the differences. So, you know, what we're saying here is that these themes emerged more in one group or another. Um, of course, this is exploratory research. It's not. We're not making causal statements here. We can't make causal statements. Um, but there were a few things that did emerge that I think are quite important. So having a secure and regular income was really important. So those that where the income was not enough, um, quite often were unsure of what their annual income was. So their income was coming from benefits, um, it may have been seasonal work, you know, it was very lumpy. Um, but also, you know, sometimes payments were being made at source, so they didn't really, and it's hard, quite hard to plan if you don't actually know what your income stream is. Also, the nature of the needs. Now, while there were, very, you know, there were common needs, of course there were common needs for accommodation, rental cost, power, food, um, and transport, there were also more specific needs for some families. So, say, educational costs, phone for those in a rural area, um, chronic medical condition expenses, um, you know, those, those sorts of items that some families had and some families didn't have. And there's also the issue of debt, the extent to which these families were debt. Now, uh, commonly, the families did not want to get into debt. They, they said, you know, they, were, they had a real aversion to getting into debt. 
But within the two groups, of course, they were in different circumstances. So the ones with the adequate, they tended to have managed debt. So they, they might have a, a credit card and use a credit card, but they knew that they could pay that credit card off. Those in the um, inadequate group were more likely to have got to that point where, where getting into debt was a last resort. So they had to, you know, in order to meet the needs, they had to get into debt. And as one parent said, you know, if you end up in debt, you've got to have a plan to get out of it. You know, so that, it was quite interesting. And, and it was also interesting, I think, um, the researchers talked about the extent to which, when they were discussing this, they often talked about other people, examples of other people who had got into debt. Quite often younger people, you know, there was this kind of discussion about younger people wanting these flash cars and things like that. Uh, it, this, this wasn't the case with this group. There's also um, a difference in terms of the extent to which the two groups were actively managing their um, financial position. So here's, here's someone saying we didn't have enough in the past, but by learning how to budget, it's helped us have enough. So examples of the financial strategies that people talked about were having a budget and using it, sticking to it, uh, looking for bargains, and, and quite a few of them mentioned using the internet, so it's interesting how that technology is, is coming into it. Um, and saving for bigger items and setting aside money for the big bills that they knew they were going to be getting so that they could cover those. And getting help from others and also using a grocery list, which is probably something I should get into as well. But that's, um, again, themes that came out. A big one here, um, and quite interesting, sort of discussion around this issue for in, within the groups was support from family um, and the community. And, the, and a lot of these families were very dependent on that support. Those, those that were in the inadequate group had a very positive um, attitude towards getting help and support. They really valued it. Um, there was a, a degree of reciprocity and sharing that was going on um, in the community. Uh, so they got support, but they could also give support. That you know there was a degree of bartering going on, um, and, and you know they themselves would support others. Um, support often in the form of money or food or clothing, and, and some of them also talked about getting support from schools and from community uh, agencies as well. But family, I think, was a primary um, group that, that provided assistance. So here's some more examples, um, talking about support received. Now these are from the rural area, I think they're from Northland, um, and you can see there that, you know, the, the way in which the community support, and actually this comes from Kahu who's here, who's done research in um, Māori and the urban and rural areas, and, and this is a theme I think that came out in her research, was the degree to which, you know, the support was offered. Um, but of course, being in a rural area also has its costs, and transport in particular um, can be very expensive. Petrol price was something that was mentioned quite often. Um, and then having reliable communication, so having a telephone in the nature of um, that also had an impact. Now, of course, when we're asking these people to make their judgments about how adequate their income is uh, in terms of their, their needs and necessities, this is kind of, it's usually, it's in a fairly tight window. But we know from previous research, for example, the analysis of the SOFI data that's been done, that people move in and out of the status. So it's likely that, and, and we know from these discussions that were being held, that, that those in the not enough group had times where they had, had enough. Those that, where they, you know, were reporting currently we've got enough money, had had times where they didn't have enough. So these families were, we're often moving out of these um, statuses. Um, and there were a range of things that were mentioned as contributing, really as kind of tipping points, is how, how we're thinking about it. So there's, there's uh, some of the themes that were mentioned, so relationship separation, and you know we know that going from two incomes, separating, having to support a household on one income can have a very significant impact some quite interesting analysis on how quickly people get back, you know, men and women get back to their pre-income, uh, pre-separation income levels. 
Um, illness as well. I mean, illness can have a major impact again in terms of uh, loss of employment, but also in terms of support, paying for uh, doctor's visits and medication and things. Loss of a job, clearly if you lose one of your incomes, then um, that can have a very significant impact and it can tip you from just getting by to, to not getting by. Um, and then unexpected costs. So there are things to do with medical bills, which I've mentioned, but also around car repairs um, and funeral costs as, as that uh, quote illustrates there. So those are, um, those are just really a taste of um, what's in the report and uh, as I say I'd encourage you to read it. What, what really can, implications can we take from this? Um, you know I will preface this by saying this was exploratory research. Um, I hope it helps people understand you know what's really been behind that question and answers to that question. Um, and so, the, you know, these implications really, in terms of what policies we might um, think about, is tentative. Um, however, this research really does agree um, with a lot of previous research and strengthens that. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, the role of Superu really to contribute this ev evidence into the policy debate. So there are things around financial planning skills, um, building of strong relationships, um, building an optimistic outlook and, and self-esteem and again you know I've seen recent research that's supporting that. Um, family and community support is, is really important in how we build that um, and helping to control those major and unexpected um, expenses. And, and so, so what can we do to build this res resilience within families so that when they do have these tipping points, these unexpected shocks, they are better able to cope. Um, and I think there's another, I haven't got that on the list here, but I think, you know, parking back to the, one of the very first slides is that issue, that tension between how I care for my children and how I increase my income. And, you know, we know that's, that's the classic difficulty for families in getting that balance right. And being a researcher, you know, it's really incumbent on me to say, well, you know, we need more research. <laughs> but I really believe we do here. Um, and, and what I've listed there is the surveys that use this question. So there is the Household Economic Survey, but there's also the General Social Survey, and we have how many waves of that now, Philip? We have four waves of that. Um, and that, you know, so that has a number of sort of social dimensions in there, as well as income measures, as well as this perceived income adequacy question. The Quality of Life Survey also has this question in here. There's been a bit of an analysis done of that. Um, growing up in New Zealand study has this in, this in the data wave collection at year two. So again, there's, you know, there's a wealth of uh, multi-domain information in there that it would be really interesting to do some quantitative analysis of. Um, and Te Kupinga also has this question in as well, and that, that data's recently been released. So again, I think there's plenty of potential for um, testing out the model for looking at the relative importance of these factors um, in this judgment of income adequacy. And I will leave it there and open the floor to questions.